Hello everyone, Charles Watts here, the Arsenal correspondent at Gold, joining you on Tuesday. And I'm back after a few days of a social media hiatus, shall I say, obviously joining in the wider football communities online social media blackout uh, to sort of highlight the issue of social abuse and discrimination and obviously it's not going to make a massive change straight away but I feel like it was important just to do something for just to try and bring some sort of change down the line and to show the social media companies that something needs to be done to stop um, the just a disgrace that is social media abuse and how easy it is for people to do what they do, say what they say without any fear of any sort of repercussion really. So um, I felt it was an important thing to do but I am back now and obviously there's been lots going on since uh, since over the weekend. Arsenal won a game of football as well. That man over there, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang scoring the second goal up at Newcastle in that 2-0 win. I think that's probably Arsenal's most comfortable win of the season. He absolutely dominated from start to finish. Obviously, Arteta made eight changes uh, for it. He kind of thought, oh, you know, Newcastle need to win to guarantee himself safety. Arsenal got the two games. This one sandwiched between the two semi-final legs. Probably going to be a difficult one, especially given the changes, but absolutely complete opposite. Newcastle were awful. Arsenal very, very good. Dominated from start to finish. 1-2-0, clean sheet, job done. Thank you very much. Um, if only if only every week was as simple as that. <laughs> Not really been the case this season, but it's always enjoyable, even in a game which, safe to say, was a bit of a dead rubber, to be honest. Um, uh, it was just, it was nice to watch. It was nice to see Arsenal play well, keep a clean sheet, look solid, um, move the ball relatively quickly, create chances. I think they had 19 shots, only scored two. That was probably the one issue. They didn't take the, get, take the chances that they had began to fear at some point, didn't you? Like, oh God, what are Arsenal going to do? Are they going to manage to shoot themselves in the foot and somehow manage to not win this one? When's the big mistake coming? But thankfully, that sort of big mistake that we've seen plague Arsenal games so, so many times this season didn't happen. They were very dominant. They were very solid. Um, Matt Ryan played in goal again instead of Bert Leno. Played very well, I thought. Commanded that penalty area really well. Made the one save you really had to make in the game in the first half from Alan St. Maximan. And um, they just looked really, really solid. So, Full credit to Arsenal for that one. Hopefully that warms them up nicely for the big, big match this coming Thursday. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later on in this video, certainly about the team news anyway. But I wanted to start today on the takeover or the, I don't know, you can't really talk, call it a takeover, but the takeover interest of Daniel Ek, the Spotify owner. Um, obviously we covered that a lot last week. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about it, in case you hadn't seen, that Thierry Henry has actually been speaking publicly about this for the first time. Henry is obviously one of the three invincibles involved in this with Bergkamp and Vieira. Daniel Ek has very wisely got them on side. Certainly helps, helps with the uh, PR game. Um, and uh, Henri's been talking about it. It was on Sky Sports last night on Monday Night Football. And they asked him about it. It was pretty open. Um, which, is, again, kind of follows on from the theme that we've seen in this takeover, really. No one on the Daniel X side, I think, seems to be really too worried about talking about it publicly. Whether the Cronkies like that, KSE like that, I don't know. But they've obviously made a very calculated decision that this should be something that should go public which isn't always ideal in big multi-billion pound attempted takeovers. Normally everything is um, sort of shrouded in secrecy until it happens. But the Daniel Ek team certainly, I think, have made this calculated decision that maybe it's worth just to keep the pressure, piling the pressure on, is to be as public as possible with it. Whether that works in the long term, we'll have to wait and see. But here's what Thierry has had to say about it. He said, he approached us, we listened to him, and we knew first and foremost that he wanted to involve the fans. We actually met the Arsenal supporters trust and told them what we wanted to do. We want to bring back on board. We want to bring them back on board, being part of the meetings, knowing what's happening because you need to put the DNA back into the club. He wants to re-inject the Arsenal DNA, the identity that for me is now long gone. You don't have Arsenal people there among the board that can show the right direction. Sort of what the right words there from Thierry Henry. What he doesn't say in this, again, is exactly what him, Burkamp and Vieira are to do with this. And I think that's the really interesting thing here. Yes, it's great to have their names on board. Yes, it's a massive PR winner. Um, always will be. But what exactly are they going to do? What is their involvement? Is it just their names? Is it just um, the sway that they will have on the general Arsenal fan? Is that why they're involved? Or is there you know, potential for them to be on the board? When he says here, you don't have Arsenal people there among the board... 
it would that be their job should this go through but no one's really talked about that no one's answered that and i mean it's certainly not going to be financial is it they're not here to bring any finances to the table because let's face it although they're far richer than me you and pretty much everyone else out there they're certainly not rich enough to have any sort of financial say in the goings on at the club because their, their bank balance will be wiped out after about a month should that be the case so um it's got to be something else and it's it's going to be interesting to find out exactly what their long-term role would be should this takeover attempt end up being successful in the long run. Uh, Thierry also went on, he said, look, he, he is already, and I'll give you something here, he's reached out to the Cronkies and already said himself that he has collated the funds to make sure that he can put a good bid in. Now they need to listen. A lot of people have been screaming that they want the owner out. We are trying to offer a solution involving the fans and getting the DNA of the club back. So interesting there that he said that he has, uh, Daniel Ek has now written to the Cronkies um, and well, not written, but he's reached out to the Cronkies. And that, um, as we know, that bid is supposed to be incoming around 1.8 billion is going to be the starting uh, offer that we see from Daniel Ek, which could come in the next sort of week or so. So, yeah, an uh, interesting one. It's something certainly going to rumble on. Thierry, Thierry rumbled on uh, a little bit more. I won't read all the quotes, but he talked about how you know he's well aware that this is something that's going to go on possibly for the long term. And they're not just in it. Daniel Ek's not going to go away if this bid Rick gets rejected first time out he's here for the long term it'll be interesting to see exactly what sort of response if anything we get from uh, the Cronkies should a bid come in will they release another statement like the one they did a, few, a week ago saying that they are absolutely not going to sell the club will we hear um, from the Daniel X side of things what the response has been from the Cronkies that remains to be seen but it's not going away anytime soon. We saw the protests on the, uh, the weekend against Manchester United. The, saw the Liverpool game called off Arsenal fans. Some of them pro planning to protest again on Thursday night ahead of the Europa League semi-final. I don't think we're probably going to see protests on the scale that we did ahead of the Everton game. It'll be interesting to see the numbers involved in that one. Um, obviously, it's a huge game for Arsenal, that one. You don't really want the team disrupted ahead of that. But again... You know, Manchester United, Liverpool was huge. And the bigger the game, the the bigger the story if uh, the fans get involved and, and protest. So um, it'll be interesting to see exactly the sort of numbers that uh, attend Thursday night's meeting. Potentially for me, I think maybe the Premier League games are the better ones between now and the end of the season to really make the point get across just because this game on Thursday night is so, so huge for Arsenal, for the players, for Arteta and everyone else. But uh, I'm not the one to make that decision. All right, so that's about it from the takeover. And now let's talk about some um, Arsenal players, shall we? I want to talk a little bit about Gabriel Martinelli and that fantastic performance in that game there. Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang in that exact picture is running over to celebrate with Gabriel Martinelli because the Brazilian just put in that wonderful, wonderful cross, which Aubameyang scored a lovely finish from Orba uh, to make it 2-0. And uh, it was just a sort of crowning glory, really, on a very, very good Martinelli performance. I thought he was great playing over on the left-hand side. He absolutely tore Ch Jacob Murphy to shreds. Murphy will probably be having nightmares about him still now. I thought it was a really mature performance from Gabby as well. And maybe that's what we're seeing um, as he starts to get a little bit more game time now because he is. This is his third Premier League start in... in um, pretty much a month for Martinelli. So he's getting a little bit more game time now. And you do wonder if the work that Arteta and the coaching staff have been doing with him behind the scenes is maybe trying to iron out a little bit of the erraticness about his game and make him a little bit more disciplined to sort of fit exactly the way Arteta wants to play. And I thought this was it. It's certainly, you know, he's certainly caused him all sorts of problems, ran with the ball, did all, everything that he did well, but he kept his position well throughout. Um, he didn't sort of leave the left, left wing at all, did, didn't get sucked into the centre where maybe he wants to play more. I thought it was a good, disciplined, mature performance from Gabby Martinelli, topped off with that fabulous assist for the goal. Um, and he was just a real, real threat throughout and um, it deserves an awful lot of credit for that. And as you can imagine, he was a big talking point in a press conference afterwards. I asked Mikel about it. Mikel always gets a bit touchy when you ask about Martinelli. You can tell it annoys him a little bit. He, 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 understand, he, he definitely knows the criticism that's out there. Obviously, after the game on Thursday night, Martin Keown went very strong and said that he just didn't like Martinelli. He thought Arteta didn't like Martinelli. And he could, I think that got to uh, Mikel a little bit. And one of the responses you see here, he sort of touches on it, although he doesn't name uh, Keown specifically. Um, but you can always tell with Mikel. It's kind of like Guardiola with Phil Foden. He always got really touchy when he got brought up why he's not playing enough uh, last season that he used to get to Guardiola. And I think it's very similar when it comes to Mikel. So this is what he had to say. You know, I asked him um, 
uh, asked him about his performance and also about the, the kind of the lack of playing time. And I said, look, there's a general feeling here that maybe you are not using him that much because you, you and the coaching staff are putting a lot of work onto him behind the scenes and trying to develop him perhaps more into a striker, that sort of thing. Is that the case? And here's what he said. He said, just look at how much he's played in the last few years and how much he's played with me when he's available. Then we can discuss that. It's just what happens. This debate is always happening when you don't win. If it's not him, it'll be someone else. If it's not Gabby, it'll be Lacazette, Willian or Pepe. It's part of it. I'm not sure it'll be Willian, to be honest, too much. I don't think many people are going to complain too much. Um, he said, Gabby is improving everything. Every week he's taking his minutes in the right way and he's developing the way we all believe he can. Against Newcastle, he had an assist, which was an important moment. And he had some good moments off the left and also trying to play as the number nine as well. I then asked him where he sees him long term. Is it left or is it number nine? And he said, time will tell, but I'd like to develop him in both positions because I think he's got the potential to do both. If there are any doubts, I love Gabby so much more than all of you together. I think that was the line that was in response to what Martin Keown had to say on Thursday. Thursday night. Now, it's going to be a really interesting one to see plays on Thursday night for Arsenal. You think Orba got 78 minutes against Newcastle, so he's going to play against Villarreal. I think that's an absolute certainty he'll play. There were the whole false nine experiment, uh, that would have just been a one-off. Now that Orba's got 78 minutes under his belt and he scored, which is a big boost, he'll certainly lead the line against Villarreal. And then it's all a case of who plays in that three behind him. I think it'll be Saka will be on the right. Saka got a rest against Newcastle. Then it'll be either Smith Rowe or Martin Odegaard as the number 10. And then who plays on that left-hand side? Pepe, great in the first leg, scored the penalty, was Arsenal's best player. Does he play there or does Martinelli keep his place on the left-hand side? You've also got the option of Emil Smith-Rowe, but I'm not sure we'll see Smith-Rowe there. I think it'd probably be Pepe or Martinelli. If I had to say now who it'll be, I imagine it'll be Pepe. But Martinelli showed on Thursday night, again, with that sort of performance, that maturity in that performance, that he could be ready to really make his mark on this first team now. Um, you know, the last three games in the Premier League, scored against Sheffield United, played very well in that game. He's got the assist against Newcastle, played very well again. You know, he's showing that he can do it on a regular basis when given the chance now. And it's, you know, it's, good to see. it's a good option for Mikel to have. It's a bit of a selection headache, which you want to see because Pepe's playing well, Martinelli's playing well. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see who lines up on the left-hand side of that attack. But um, I think we'll certainly see Martinelli a lot more in these final games of the Premier League season now. And he's absolutely deserving of his place because of the type of performances that we're seeing him produce now are making him very, very difficult for Mikel to ignore. OK, on team news ahead of Thursday night's game, obviously we really want Lacazette and um, certainly Tierney to be available, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Last week, Mikel said that they were all in contention for that second leg, but from, following on from that comment, we've not seen either Lacazette or uh, Kieran Tierney train yet. Um, I asked Mikel afterwards on Sunday, you know, have they got any sort of chance? And he said they haven't trained with the team yet, so I think they're unlikely to be available, which is a big, big blow. Not so much with Lacquer, although, you know, Lacquer was playing very well before the injury. At least you've got Orba there. He can play striker and scored against scored on Sunday. And you would hope he's going to be in confident mood uh, ahead of the game. But certainly the left-back situation, you really want Kieran Tierney there. Granit Xhaka played again on Thursday, uh, sorry, on Sunday against Newcastle. You imagine once again he'll play there on um, this coming Thursday night but then you've also got to remember there's no Danny Ceballos because he's suspended so will Mohamed on any line up against Thomas Partey potentially think that will probably be probably be the case um, it's certainly if Granit Xhaka is at left back um, but you just really want Kieran Tierney available it's such a shame this injury you just want him back at least he's getting back ahead of schedule but still for the game of this sort of magnitude you'd love to have Kieran Tierney available but it doesn't look like it and it doesn't look like David Luiz well definitely not going to be David Luiz we saw him limp off with that injury hamstring problem against Newcastle real shame for Luiz real shame for Arteta worked really hard to get back after that knee surgery I thought it was impressive in the time it was on the pitch against Newcastle you saw what he brings that is almost that he's almost like a playmaker he's like a deep line playmaker the quality of his passes so so good he really demonstrated that against Newcastle it was his pass that set up Bellerin uh, to get the ball in for the uh, Mohamed Elneny opener he did a couple more as well and um, he just again highlighted how important he is to this Arsenal team when he's fit and available and it's a real shame he's going to be out now because I think he certainly would have started on Thursday night. We'll have to wait and see the exact extent of this hamstring injury. Um, Sammy Mockbell over at the Daily Mail saying that he Arsenal don't think it's too bad and that he should um, could possibly be available before the end of the season, which would be good news for Arsenal. Um, and certainly if the manager 
to make it to the uh, Europa League final in Gdansk, but unfortunately, certainly not going to be involved this week, this uh, midweek, sorry, on Thursday night, which will be a big, big blow. Other than that, it looks all good for Arsenal. They're the main injury problems at the moment. It'll be interesting to see plays in goal. Will uh, Bert Leno come out back in or will Matt Ryan? Um, Matt Ryan very good again against Newcastle, although Bert Leno played well on the Thursday night in the first leg against Villarreal. That's what Mikel had to say on David Luiz. He said, we don't know. He felt something in his hamstring, so it's not good news. He's put in such a shift to be back for the team in the last few weeks after his knee surgery. So it's a real, real shame. Could well possibly not see David Luiz in an Arsenal shirt again if this injury is a bad one and Arsenal don't get to the Europa League final and he doesn't play this season. Then given his contracts up at the end of the uh, end of the campaign, that could well be it for David Luiz in an Arsenal shirt. But hopefully not, because uh, as much criticism he has got recently, um, since he's arrived at Arsenal, he's still a very, very important player to this team. Okay, quickly before I go, just quickly on Reese Nelson. I always get messages about Reese Nelson. What's going on with him? What's going on? Uh, well, Mikel did answer a question from Art DeRoche over at The Athletic about Reese Nelson in his press conference on Sunday. So just thought I'd read this out for those Reese Nelson fans out there who haven't seen it. He said, with Reese, I would like to give him more. He's a boy who tries really hard, trains every day. He wants to do extra all the time. It's very difficult at the moment with the players we have to fit him in. I feel sorry we don't have other competitions to use him in because he deserves more. He doesn't play and that's my fault. I think that says it all about Reese Nelson when it comes to Arsenal and his Arsenal future. Um, he will be off in the summer. I'm pretty certain of that. Mikel clearly doesn't think he's up to it um, compared to some of the other options he has in attack, whether you agree with that or not. Um, you know, Many of you probably say we should be playing ahead of Willian, and I wouldn't disagree with that on the performances we've seen this season. But the fact is, Mikel is a manager, and he clearly doesn't think he warrants a place in a starting spot at the moment. So it's going to be best for all parties that that one is a relationship that separates in the summer. Reese needs to go out and play, and there's no point staying at Arsenal now in the summer if he's not going to get that game time under Mikel Arteta. Right, everyone, thank you very much for watching. Appreciate your time as always. Please do enjoy your week. We'll be speaking to Mikel tomorrow, 10 a.m. press conference ahead of that Villarreal game, and I will try and pop on, record a video to discuss exactly what he had to say after that match. So keep an eye out for that one. Until then, have a good day, everyone. Speak to you soon.